Szerelem, szerelem, átkozott gyötrelem. Just a couple of years ago, I was in, um, I was in a, a debate, a debate at the ICA. It was on a, it was on a platform. It was like, there was on the panel, there was a doctor, me, 70-odd-year-old artist, quite famous, and a writer. And, we, and, and the debate was about extreme curating, talking about violence, strategies, uh, shocking, within the context of art. Anyway, we're having this debate, and in the audience, in the audience was a 50-year-old a, a Russian guy and a... And, and, and a, and a and his friend, a lady, and they were shouting abuse. It was Alexander Brenner, the guy's name, and Barbara Schutz. And he was shouting. At the, when the guy beside me was talking about his way, he was shouting at him, heckling him, saying, that's right, get, shit, bollocks! And I was like, and I could see the woman who was sort of like in charge of the ICA sitting there, it was packed in there, packed, there was not a seat in the place. Anyway. Suddenly, the Russian guy gets up, walks down the aisle, and comes towards a towards a stage, undoes his belt and his trousers, and pulls his pants down. He crouches down. He gets his hand. He puts his hands. <coughs> and does a massive. A massive sh a massive sh in his hand, in his fucking hand. He sh his hand in the front, in 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 front of everybody, and he's got it there like that, and he's wiggling himself to pull his pants up, and he does it, and he gets his trousers up, he he does his belt up, which was just incredible, and he's got this shit in his hand, and he goes up to the fellow next to me and offers it to him. He's like that. Here. Here. Here, mate. And the guy's like, Fuck it. what? <laughs> and he wouldn't take it off him. So Alexander Brenner took this shit and he put it, he put it in the fella's glass of water on the, on, on the table. He just put it and he just left it there. And he wiped his hand on the material of the uh, on the carpet of the stage, and went and sat back down. Oh, mate, the, f the smell! Ah, oh, the smell! But it's about extreme curating. No one's moving. She ain't the woman running the gaff. It's not, she's not saying anything. And the doctor's carrying on, she's leading the discussion, and just carry on talking. And I don't know what the fellow ate, that Alexander Brenner, I don't know what he ate, or what his diet was like. But they, that was put, it was like, it was like beetroot, it's like been eating beetroot. And it was there, and it was discolouring the water. And then the woman, because the, the, the discussion just carried on, and then the Barbara shirts, she got up, and, and there was like, like some sort of like pistachio or, or cashew nuts that was on the platform. No one was eating them now. And she went up and she picked, she was picking up the nuts with her elbow on the platform. Everyone's still talking. <laughs> she was picking up the nuts and flicking them. At the guy's head, was <laughs> the riot. <laughs> <him on> the <laughs> and she was Austrian, <laughs> and she says to him, "Do you like nuts?" <laughs> and she flick another thing and hit him on the head. Oh, mate. Oh. You gotta look those people up. Alexander Brenner and Barbara Schertz. They do. Sh he shits everywhere. He shits in front of a Van Gogh. He 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 fam He got three years. He got three years in prison in Russia 
for this Vlad, if you know Vladimir Malevich, one of the most famous Russian artists, one of the most famous artists of all time, he'd done a white cross on a white background, he'll stand a black cross, but this one here, the white cross on a white background, Alexander Brenner spray painted in green a US dollar sign on it in the middle of the museum. You got, yeah, I've got, there's another video on YouTube, he's got a big mass of fuck off stick and he's smashing everything. And another time he goes, he does these, he goes to private views and does these loud screaming, uninvited screaming performances where he just goes in to the private view and everyone's looking at the art and he does his bit, but he just goes in and just goes, ah! Continually, yeah. they're quite confrontational because, like, I met them after that incident. I met them and and they brought me, they stole some meat and came and gave it to me. It was out of thing, and they attacked. They attacked this band where they they sort of tried to take this person's pants off, and he jumped on the stage. Alexander Brenner kicked the drums over and nicked the microphone and started screaming, let's have an orgy. Because they had se like sexy dancers. It was another art event. Alexander Breno and Barbara Schutz. They're always talking about uh, Giorgio Agamben. Never had any money, them two either. They just wonder what they're up to now. I like those people.
that we've met before and laughed before and loved before but who knows where Ladies and gentlemen, the very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. And we are, as a people, inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. We decided long ago that the dangers of excessive and unwarranted concealment of pertinent facts far outweighed the dangers which are cited to justify it. Even today, there is little value in opposing the threat of a closed society by imitating its arbitrary restrictions. Even today, there is little value in ensuring the survival of our nation if our traditions do not survive with it. And there is very grave danger that an announced need for increased security will be seized upon by those anxious to expand its meaning to the very limits of official censorship and concealment. That I do not intend to permit to the extent that it's in my control. And no official of my administration, whether his rank is high or low, civilian or military, should interpret my words here tonight as an excuse to censor the news, to stifle dissent, to cover up our mistakes, or to withhold from the press and the public the facts they deserve to know. For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of elections, on intimidation instead of free choice, on guerrillas by night instead of armies by day. It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. No expenditure is questioned, no rumor is printed, no secret is revealed. No president should fear public scrutiny of his program, for from that scrutiny comes understanding, and from that understanding comes support or opposition, and both are necessary. I am not asking your newspapers to support an administration, but I am asking your help in the tremendous task of informing and alerting the American people, for I have complete confidence and the response and dedication of our citizens whenever they are fully informed. I not only could not stifle controversy among your readers, I welcome it. This administration intends to be candid about its errors. For as a wise man once said, an error doesn't become a mistake until you refuse to correct it. We intend to accept full responsibility for our errors, and we expect you to point them out when we miss them. Without debate, Without criticism, no administration and no country can succeed, and no republic can survive. That is why the Athenian lawmaker Sola decreed it a crime for any citizen to shrink from controversy. And that is why our press was protected by the First Amendment, the only business in America 
specifically protected by the Constitution, not primarily to amuse and entertain, not to emphasize the trivial and the sentimental, not to simply give the public what it wants, but to inform, to arouse, to reflect, to state our dangers and our opportunities, to indicate our crises and our choices, to lead, mold, educate, and sometimes even anger public opinion. This means greater coverage and analysis of international news, for it is no longer far away and foreign, but close at hand and local. It means greater attention to improved understanding of the news, as well as improved transmission. And it means, finally, that government at all levels must meet its obligation to provide you with the fullest possible information outside the narrowest limits of national security. And so it is to the printing press, to the recorder of man's deeds, the keeper of his conscience, the courier of his news, that we look for strength and assistance, confident that with your help, man will be what he was born to be, free and independent. The gentlewoman yields back. The chair recognizes the gentlewoman from Ohio, Ms. Captor, for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to yeah. talk about what is nothing less than the largest transfer of the American people's wealth from Main Street to Wall Street, the largest transfer in American history due to the fallout from the financial crisis of 2008. Banks at the heart of the crisis all got larger as their CEOs made more money while average citizens saw their income stall or drop or be eliminated, and communities across this country hit hard by their losses. Recently, um, the Federal Reserve issued a startling report that showed the net worth of the average American family fell by as much as 40% during the last three years, but I can tell you the banks and speculators at the heart of this crisis that has hurt us all have all done better. It's really startling. The 2010 numbers set Families, ordinary middle class families backed by nearly two decades. America's middle class was the hardest hit. And while many families saw losses in their retirement savings, they saw their home worth go down, so many millions lost jobs, the majority of the damage nationwide was caused by the collapse of the housing market because the largest form of savings that any family actually accumulates is in the ownership of their home. According to the Federal Reserve, the median value of American stake in their homes fell by 42%, nearly half, between 2007 and 2010 by about, to about $55,000. Those are startling figures. And while we have seen wages stagnate for the vast majority of Americans during the past three decades, median income fell nearly 8% in 2010 to $45,800. Our citizens are meeting the crisis, in my opinion, with great resolve and dignity. But those largely responsible for their situations have averted any real responsibility and scrutiny. Let's just take a look. The Federal Reserve actually found that only roughly half of the America's middle class remained on the same rung on the economic ladder. Most have fallen down. But as the Federal Reserve's data show, not everyone lost in the recession. The medium net worth of the wealthiest among us, the millionaires and billionaires who helped cause the crisis, actually rose. Moreover, the value of some at the very top has simply been obscene. I think you'd say it's un-American. Let's take a look at the top executives on Wall Street. How did they fare when most Americans lost decades worth of their hard-earned savings. Reportedly, the chief executive officer of J.P. Morgan, Jamie Dimon's take for 2011 was a whopping $23.1 million. Let me pull this over. $23.1 million. That's just, you know, the take-home. 
not all the stock options and everything else. I wonder if he thinks that's enough. His salary went up 11 percent, 11 percent more, even though J.P. Morgan recently admitted to trading losses of over $2 billion. How would you like that job? He got paid more. The institution lost money, but of course it got bigger after the finance. It became one of the big six. Mr. Diamond is not alone in taking home millions more while the average American family lost much of their life savings. John Stump from Wells Fargo, well, he only earned $19.8 million for one year. 19.8. Lloyd Blankfein uh, from Goldman Sachs took in $16.2 million. That's just the uh, salary. His compensation reportedly rose by about 14.5% last year, despite a sharp decline in profits and share price during that year. Isn't that interesting? Who among us could have that kind of position? This transfer of Americans' wealth has left most communities hollowed out with abandoned homes, abandoned commercial strips, high unemployment, soaring public debts, cars that have been confiscated sitting on lots and back of banks, and weakened infrastructure across this country. When you look at this picture, you can tell there's something really wrong here. In this body, we continue to debate how to get our fiscal house in order, but Republicans have been unwilling to negotiate. Last year, we saw how House Republicans gambled with our economy. They rejected plan after plan to raise the debt ceiling and responsibly balance the budget by putting both spending cuts and revenues on the table because they were protecting these people and their like at any cost, including those who get special tax breaks and take millions even when their companies do poorly or fail. When and why are the interests of the privileged money barons put before everyone else? House Republicans refuse to provide tax relief for working families unless we give even more tax breaks to the super wealthy. We need to get our priorities straight. We need to get our fiscal house in order. We need a smart approach that puts revenues and spending cuts on the table and focus on job creation. And we need to hold these Americans accountable for the damage they have done and let them carry a hod and bear their fair share of the burden. Mr. Speaker, I yield back my remaining time and will ask unanimous consent to place information on the record. Without objection. The gentlewoman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentlewoman from Illinois, Ms. Shikoski, for five minutes. I appeared before the Congressional Committee the highest representation of the American people under subpoena to tell what I knew of activities, which I believe might lead to an attempt to set up a fascist dictatorship. The plan as outlined to me was to form an organization of veterans, to use as a bluff or as a club at least, to intimidate the government and break down our democratic institutions. The upshot of the whole thing was that I was supposed to lead an organization of 500,000 men which would be able to take over the functions of government. I talked with an investigator for this committee who came to me with a subpoena on a Sunday, November 18th. He told me they had unearthed evidence linking my name with several such veteran organizations. As it then seemed to me to be getting serious, I felt it was my duty to tell all I knew of such activities to this committee. My main interest in all this is to preserve our democratic institutions. I want to retain the right to vote, uh, the right to speak freely, and the right to write. If we maintain these basic principles, our democracy is safe. No dictatorship can exist with suffrage, freedom of speech, and press. <laughs> We got no plans, no plans at all. Evil man's always transcending. Fight her like sheep, swallow everything. Always 
simple tins of pretending. We got no plan. Quick note, if you'd like a free track from my new live comedy album, Pepper Spray the Tears Away, just send an email to pepperspraythetearsaway at gmail.com. And now, here's your moment of clarity. There are two things America has in spades. Religious people and greedy people. Alright, we have other things in spades too, such as pride and ignorance and people with an ass in the front. But we'll leave that for another time. Over 80% of Americans claim to be religious, and a high percentage of those are greedy ass. Now, I don't believe the Bible is anything more than mildly fascinating stories with a, an occasional woman getting stoned to death for giving out the at the wrong time. But if you're gonna say you're living your life by the Bible, then you have to actually do it. You have to go all out. For example, it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. That's Luke 18.25. I'm not that good with geometry, but I would say that almost means rich people can't get into heaven. Because first of all, camels are much larger than a needle unless you've got one of those adorable teacup camels, but they're expensive. And secondly, camels rarely sew anything. So the odds of them even encountering a needle are rather slim. Matthew 6.19 Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. Store up for yourself treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in. That's right, <laughs> moths. They'll get you every time. Anybody dumb enough to become a billionaire has not stopped to consider the moth. Luke 18.22, sell everything you have and give to the poor. You will have treasure in heaven. The Bible, the book you claim is written by the Lord, tells you to sell everything and give to the poor? It doesn't say give five dollars to the dude on the street who's drumming on an old bucket and then keep the rest of your millions for cars and swimming pools and blood diamonds, dancing horses and prancing masseuses, making a carnival of Holiness. Or how about Luke 3.11? Whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none, and whoever has food must do likewise. Coats? Whoever has two coats? I'm pretty sure Mitt Romney has more than two coat factories. This is your book, folks, and it says don't let anyone go cold. Don't let anyone go hungry. Don't throw families onto the streets to enrich yourselves. It probably says something about not eating foie gras, too, but we'll deal with that another time. Proverbs 31.8 Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Not only are you supposed to allow for freedom of speech rather than shooting it with a rubber bullets, you're supposed to speak for the destitute. I would be surprised if Jamie Dimon has ever spoken to the destitute, even just to curse him out. He probably pays someone to do that for him. Now listen, rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming upon you. Your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. The wages you failed to pay the workmen who mowed your fields are crying out against you. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered innocent men who were not opposing you. James 5, 1. I think the point is clear, rich people. If you don't quit treating your fellow man like you will have moths to contend with. And I'm sure there's worse stuff down in eternal damnation, like a few hot pokers up the but it sounds like the moths are pretty prevalent. Look, all I'm trying to say is this is your crazy book of fairy tales. If you choose to believe it, then believe it. I live my life based on a book called The King's Trousers, but I don't just ignore the part about the trousers. And that's what you're doing when you claim the Bible and ignore the poor. That's your moment of clarity from LeeCamp.net.
That's all.